Thank you, Professor <coughs> Rajamohan. We shall now commence the panel discussion on constructing the Indo-Pacific region, the maritime rise of China and India. May I request Professor Tan Tai Yong, Director of ISIS, and the following panelists to take their seats at the head table. Mr. Kwa Chong Guan, Dr. Tim Huxley, Professor Zhen Yang Yan, Professor Kanti Bhaspai. Professor Tang will moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ishra. Now, you've, you've all heard a uh, uh, short introduction of the book. Now, Raja Mohan has obviously written a very important, thought provoking book, and it is set to generate discussions, debates about uh, the future of Sino-Indian relations and also the impact of this uh, maritime rivalry, um, not only in their immediate neighbourhoods but far beyond. So to hear some early reactions to the book, some early responses, we are pleased to have with us a panel of very distinguished speakers to share their thoughts uh, on, on the book. Um, I will introduce them very briefly, but if you, I mean, these are all well-known individuals, but their brief bio data are in the uh, program details in your files. So I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking, starting from my extreme right, uh, Mr. Chong Wan, who is a senior fellow at the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies and also an adjunct associate professor at the Department of History at NUS. Uh, Dr. Tim Huxley, who is the Executive Director of the IISS uh, Asia, based in Singapore. Uh, Professor Cheng Yongnian, who is the uh, Director of the East Asian uh, Institute. And uh, Professor Kanti Bajpai, the Vice uh, Dean of Research at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I'll request that each speaker present their thoughts in about 10 minutes. Uh, and then when all of them have spoken, we will have perhaps uh, between 30 and 40 minutes for a general discussion. And I would like to hear your responses, not only to the author's book, but also <coughs> to the uh, views expressed by the panelists. So without further ado, may I invite Chong Guan to kick off? Well, thank you, Tanyong. And thanks to my old colleague, uh, Raja Mohan, for <coughs> inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I hope the remarks I want to make will not uh, upset you too much. Uh, the first is about the intriguing title, which uh, Kobina Fili has really referred to. It is basically the term refers to uh, Vishnu creation myth, in which Vishnu uh, persuades the warring devas and asuras to cooperate to churn the cosmic ocean for the elixir of life umbrella. And uh, so, because the devas and asuras uh, agree, and uh, Mount Miro is then uh, used as the churning stick to stir the cosmic ocean with the great Naga in Basuki coiled around it. And the devas are lined up on one side, the head, and the asuras on the other side, the tail end. And they churn the ocean for a thousand years. And as they churn, the Miro slowly sinks into the ocean. And at a point of time, Vishnu, in his uh, turtle avatar, Kumar, appears and dives into the ocean to support the uh, Miru from sinking further. And uh, <clears throat> then he also appears, depending on which version of the myth you are living to, if you go by the best version in the great uh, Vishnu classic, the Bhagavata Purana, in chapter 7. Vishnu also appears at the top, uh, dancing on the top of the mountain. Although some other variations, like I think the Shantapa Brahmana, it's uh, Indra who is pressing down the rod. And uh, so, who are the Asuras and who are the Devas? It's quite clear to tell you where you are. But who is Vishnu? Is it the US? <laughs> deciding over this whole drama. And more important, depending on the variation of that, in this churning of the ocean, a very poisonous stuff comes up before the elixir of life. And it almost overcomes the asuras, the, the devas, and the asuras at the other end. The asuras being a bit tougher, you know, don't need the help of Vishnu. 
uh, or actually Shiva. Shiva appears to swallow up that poison and it's almost over time himself. So if we go with that question, who is the Lord Shiva who appears to swallow up that poison that comes out of this churning of the ocean? I'll leave that with you. Uh, I don't want to think about here. But um, let me go on to a couple of other points you make here. Briefly, the first one is about this theme from land lovers to sailors. And so the question I ask here, if that is so, if that is how Indian Chinese history is written, and Professor Wang Gangu has also emphasized the Chinese history, that basically the continental power trying to turn to the become a maritime power in like the US or Britain, Portugal, Spain, and Holland. Is it sustainable? Because in that comparative history, India turned to the sea only once in 1025 when the Cholas raided Southeast Asia, and China turned to the sea only once during the great era of the Ming voyages to her. And so, if you look at comparative history, the French were continental powers, the Germans, Tsarist Russia, more recently the Soviet Union, all of them did not make it. Will India and China, in that context of comparative history, make it as a maritime power? My second point, and time is running out here, is this turn to the sea. To what end is it for? To what end are we having building navies to in the Mahanian version of dominating blue oceans? The conventional wisdom of us in that is for protecting of trade, that the sea is the medium on which flows transportation and trade. And of course, it goes back to the early modern era attributed to the water rally that uh, whosoever commands the sea commands the trade. And whosoever commands the trade of the world commands the riches of the world and consequently the world itself. So that has been, I think, the conventional basis and wisdom why we have navies to protect the waterway and the trade. And certainly in Singapore, we appreciate that this one what Lord Hastings authorized Stamford Raffles to do, establish a settlement of Singapore to protect trade with China. And in India, you'll be familiar with the, I think I don't want you to use it before, the ghost of Lord Curzon, that India's security dependence on this cordon sanitaire in the Indian Ocean. And of course, if you come down to World War II, the images of Britain surviving because it had the Navy to protect those convoys across the Pacific. But, two points here in representation. Number one, today, the whole economy, marine economy of shipping of goods trade is changing. Whereas the Royal Navy was protecting British ships, transporting British goods. Today, what is the commitment of the Indian or Chinese Navy to protecting ships that, hypothetically, may be owned by an Indian entrepreneur, but registered in Panama, Crewed by a motley group of people from Bangladesh, or in Pakistan, and uh, sorry, the Philippines, captained by maybe a Scotsman, transporting a cargo of goods from Myanmar, rice, to Singapore. The whole mechanics, the whole economy of shipping has changed. I think with that, the strategic significance has changed. The other is to separate the trade from naval domination. We want the rally and the early modern era onwards and again. Go back before that. Um, for much of that pre modern period, the ocean for the us in Asia, Indians, Chinese, was simply, and even Southeast Asian, open waters to be crossed. There was no idea, no issue of dominating it. So there was a very strong Indian maritime oceanic trade with Southeast Asia through the centuries, as with China. <coughs> and only in the two aberrant episodes of the Cholas and Chenga that we get these expeditions. 
Um, another second reason for navies is to protect the sea as a resource. And here, I would say, in contrary to Bob Beckman, the unclosed and the easy created may not have been a solution, but increasingly seen as the problem that he has created of needing to protect EVs and their resources, be it undersea oil or fisheries. And I'll leave it at that for that reason. The third possible reason for navies is the sea as a medium for transmission of ideas and information that uh, in the early modern era, it's Christianity and the whole issue of uh, the Portuguese and the Dutch spreading their uh, Portuguese spreading Christianity across the oceans and in an earlier era, Islam and even earlier in Buddhism. Buddhism. Um, but today, I think the issues are different. Bob Beckman has been very strong on the whole issue of the security of undersea cables on which all our lives on the internet go. <coughs> it's not up there, it's down in the ocean, those cables. And as Bob Beckman will tell you, there are no provisions right now for the protection of those cables. No legislation, nothing. When a ship is sent anchor, it pulls up those cables, or those cables are deliberately cut or whatever. So is that an issue for any days? I'll leave it to you here to discuss. But I would say here that the uh, one you have given in your book, the basis of, I think, a very interesting research program, maritime research program, in which we in South Asia and ASEAN and Singapore should be looking at. Mr. Narvin gently hinted at it. But in this emerging rivalry, and this is an energy I use when we, in RSIS, discuss with the Indian Naval College staff. We discuss this, and this is not a lot. Uh, it's not rivalry. Uh, we take the animals of a football team. Both us and the Chinese are playing very defensive tactics. You know, uh, we are probing the other side for their strength, their tactics. We're not charging into the other side yet. Occasionally we shoot the ball across and see what happens. <coughs> and you, ASEAN, could be the referee, the linesman, the waves between the two of us. I said, no, 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 that's not how we see it. <laughs> because if you take geography, then ASEAN is in the middle strip between the two of you. And either way, we are going to get trampled upon. Oh, so how you see? <laughs> yes, and for that reason, we are very, very concerned about this. And I think there is a basis here for a sort of American studies program in which both RSIS and I think uh, the South Asian studies can work with here. Thank you. In just about 11 minutes. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Raja, I'll give you a chance to respond later on, but maybe we should hear from the other panelists first, and I'm sure that you can put them all together. So uh, I'll now invite Dr. Tim Huxley to give us his views. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, ISAS uh, for inviting me to make some, some I'd like to thank uh, ISAS for inviting me to make some, some brief comments. Um, Roger Mohan's uh, book, Samuel Mantan, uh, examines one of the most important themes in contemporary Asian security affairs, uh, the question of the emergent strategic rivalry between, uh, between what are the world's two most populous countries, and um, of course there is a specific focus on, on the maritime dimensions of this rivalry. He's, he's provided a very detailed analysis of the geopolitics of the naval expansion programs of China and India, including efforts to expand uh, India's uh, naval reach into the Pacific and, and China's growing, evidently growing interest in the Indian Ocean. Um, so he, he, he highlights the extent to, to which uh, Indian and, and Chinese naval activities are increasingly overlapping and coming into contact with each other. And he also looks at the questions of, of island bases and, and the very uh, important competition for influence around the, the littorals of the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. And he looks very importantly in, in great detail at efforts to mitigate the what he calls the Sino-Indian security dilemma through 
ex exploratory confidence building measures. And as, as one would expect, this is a very nicely written and extremely readable book, uh, which uses, uh, where applicable, uh, certain international relations concepts, but is not, uh, in contrast to uh, many more academic books, it's not, it's not in awe of, of international relations concepts. And for, for example, in Rajamohan's chapter on ordering the Asia, oh, sorry, ordering the Indo-Pacific, he makes an extremely worthwhile point that the real world does not adhere to neatly structured concepts from political theory. And he goes on to observe that decision makers in China and India are likely to pursue cooperative security and Asian concert, concert and the balance of power simultaneously. And I think that's a very astute observation on the real on the way that the, the, the real world of foreign security policy works, which uh, often does not fit into the neat categories that uh, many academics would like it to. I think the book's most important argument is that the, the nature of the US relationship with China and India and the unfolding dynamic between Beijing and New Delhi are likely to be the principal determinants of the future security order in the Indo-Pacific region. In his concluding chapter, Rajmohan uh, assesses what he refers to as the um, the strategic triangle involving the United States, India, and China, and its potential impact on the region. That, is, that I think, is a masterly chapter, and would alone make this book a worthwhile read. And he notes particularly the difficulties that Washington and New Delhi face in translating their convergent interests into an effective coalition, which I think is a very realistic and important observation. Um, by the way, just one sideline. I, I was quite um, enthralled by the way that Raj Mohan uh, uh, makes fairly extensive references in the book to the work of the great uh, historian and, and naval strategist K. M. Panika. Um, Panika was was a man um, of remarkable vision, and as as far as I know, incidentally, was was the first writer in the English language. Uh, on international relations anywhere to use the term Southeast Asia, and that was in 1943. I think even before Mountbatten's command was uh, was established, and I mean, the term had been used in German uh, um, maybe 40 or 50 years earlier, but that was the first usage in the, in, in the English language. Uh, I think this is an, an authoritative, authoritative and, and overall an extremely persuasive volume. It, it's also a stimulating book and it provokes a number of questions for me. Um, I'll mention just a couple of these. In the first place, um, I must say that I, having read the book, I do wonder about this question of the substantial asymmetry in the relationship between India and China, and what this could mean in the long term, in, t in terms of their economic size, their rate of growth, and by many, many economic and social indices. Um, and uh, let alone the scale of their defense spending and, the, and uh, the, the divergent spending on military R&D between India and China. China has huge advantages over India. I think that has to be faced. Uh, well, you, you can argue, uh, as, um, as Raj Mohan does in this book, that this asymmetry provides, as it were, a, a prima facie case for closer strategic relations on India's part with the United States. Um, but I wonder, what are the implications for India's power and influence if China does continue to grow inexorably, and at the same time, the United States is seriously hobbled by long-term economic and ultimately uh, military uh, weakness in terms of its capacity to project power into this, this region. And that leads me on to a second question. The book focuses on Sino-Indian -Indi rivalry and on the US regional security role, but well, what about the Indo-Pacific's prosperous and increasingly well-armed medium powers? My own sense is that Japan, uh, Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Australia could well play more assertive and important roles in regional security in the coming years and decades, with the result that the Indo-Pacific may become much more evidently multipolar. Uh, I think it's worth remembering K.M. Panikkar's vision as early as 1943 
of India collaborating with Indonesia to maintain security in Southeast Asia. So, so, so I suppose the second question uh, for me is, uh, what part might India's relations, particularly in the naval sphere, with these regional medium powers play in the emerging regional order? Uh, this, is the, this is the focus, of, of course, of the book's chapter six um, on India's Pacific ambitions. Um, but I think it does provoke the question um, of, of where is India's strategic engagement with, with Southeast Asia uh, going? And why has it been so episodic and, as Raj Mohan says, fitful so far? Because in this part of the world, I think it's true that India is seen as a, as a benign and essentially unthreatening power. Uh, but despite some uh, quite interesting developments in India's strategic relations with individual Southeast Asian countries over the last half decade, half decade or so, I think India's regional role still seems relatively unimpressive and undeveloped next to China's. And on that note, uh, I'll stop, apart from saying again that I think this is an impressive book that all concerned with the major power dynamics of Asia should read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kim. Now perhaps a, a view from uh, the Chinese side, but uh, his name is of course based in Singapore, he doesn't represent the Chinese view, but he will give us some good insights uh, from the Chinese perspective perhaps. So what do you think? I've tried. But it was difficult to, to represent China as such a big country. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Raja Mohan for such an uh, excellent book. And uh, I really I enjoyed reading it. I think this is the first book I, I, I read, I have read. And it's a very systematic analysis of China, uh, India, strategic relations, and it's wonderful. I think. Uh, and it's a very, very balanced uh, analysis and, uh, about China and India. And, uh, first of all, I would say Raja is uh, realistic enough. I think he, you know, he identified all kind of sources, potential source for India uh, China rivalry competition. And, uh, and uh, as I already mentioned, and, uh, both countries are growing, and uh, both countries are quite uh, nationalistic. And the both country, you know, have <coughs> greater now increasing energy demand, all kind of source, and the pushing those two countries into to become more time uh, power. It's very important. But also, I think uh, you know it's balanced because he also is is idealistic, quite uh, quite nice, and he also identified a potential area for cooperation. <coughs> how the two great power can deal with issue, can work together. I think it's, uh, it's uh, unlike uh, some other books, you know, focus on only rival side or, or cooperation side. It's uh, very much uh, balanced. I think I, li I like it. It's a combination of uh, realism or idealism. Even he uh, didn't refuse to use <laughs> this kind of international relation literature terms. But here I would like to, not, not to, uh, not, will not be able to represent China, but uh, I will make a few points uh, based on my own observation and my own understanding of China, particularly its culture and its people. Uh, my first point is, uh, you know, I'm thinking about whether China really is able to become a maritime power you know, turn to see. Of course, uh, in this year, you know, a lot of debate in China and a lot of argument you know, in China should become a maritime power. But whether China will be able to become one is a big question. I think ever since the Ming Dynasty, if we look back to Chinese history, a lot of debate whether China should turn to the sea or, or focus on land. I, I think this issue is not solved even until today. Still a lot of debate. Because uh, it's uh, very simple. The British became a maritime power because of its simple geographical factors. The United States, the same, you know, very, very simple geographic constraint. But for China, China because it is surrounded by dozens of, of countries, and, and it's very difficult for China 
and to become a maritime uh, power. Even today, if you look at uh, China's west side, you know, Xinjiang, Tibet, Central Asia, Russia, you know, all uh, constraint factors, you know, and in, in the constraint China to uh, to become maritime power. A lot of debate even today. Uh, even even in recent year, particularly when China now is having difficulty with Japan in in the East Coast side, and many scholars have uh, have been debating whether should China should have formally should have a look west policy. That means you focus on Central Asia and the Middle East because also China is a major uh, major. I mean, how to say, and the energy. Imported from from Middle East, China certainly has a reason to focus on uh, this uh, ban or limited strategy. So uh, I would say it's too early to judge whether China really will put on you know, all his emphasis on on long time uh, power. And my second uh, point is I would say whether China will well somehow I feel because Raja uh, compare China on the Azerbaijan power uh, history. But I think that China is not fixed as a great power. China has, what, what China is now trying to learning to be a great power. You know, since I think the fall of the Soviet Union, I think China is still is a learning state. China has learned from the Soviet Union a lot. So I, when I go over all kind of literature, how China is trying to learn from both the Soviet Union and the United States. I found a quite an interesting point. For example, their conclusion is like the Soviet type of 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 expressionism does not work, and the Soviet Union type of socialism with poverty doesn't work. So so this is, this is for China still the leadership its a top priority is still domestic development because they know. Why the United States is become so strong? Not because of the United States Navy power or Air Force, but because of the United States economic power. You know, it's it's a big economy, so it's very very important. Also, they also you know have learned you know after the uh, after this you know after the fall of Soviet Union, Union, why the United States <coughs> began to decline? Also because of its its economy, not because of its its military. So uh, I would say so. For for the foreseeable future, as China, the Chinese leadership will continue to focus on its domestic development, not not foreign policy. If you look at the foreign policy structure, really in China, I always see very sympathetic about China's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs because in all other countries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is so important. But China, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs does, does, does not have does not have any substantial power. The, the power structure. For for is not there for a great power is is not, not there. So other China also learning, for example, and uh, uh, I saw a, a, lots of literature to argue why democracy become a biggest burden for for the United States. So China doesn't want to 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 have its own ideological sense for 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 other countries. And uh, as, as as the third point I want to see. Because Raja uh, mentioned that both China and India are civilizational state. So I wish you know, Raja could uh, look into civilization side. Really, China is not a Western type of nation state yet. It's a still a civilization state. If you look at the tradition, China is, a, is a not a, uh, China was not a missionary power. Chinese culture, just like Indian culture, are quite inclusive, not, not, not exclusive. And I'm quite a, so can accommodate uh, as a uh, as as a powers that I think uh, matters a lot. Even now, I I, I think because the Raja did, did not look into the ideological side, but right? personally I feel you know, in terms of foreign policy uh, or international strategy, the ideological sense is still very important. And this, ever since Deng Xiaoping, the leadership has been trying to form a new ideology. What well, Deng Xiaoping so called Kao Guang Yang Hui the low. Four five policy. Later on, China proposed so-called peaceful development or peaceful uh, uh, rise. But latest, the, the new concept is the so-called new type of great power relations. Well, 
you might be suspicious about this uh, ideology, you know, whether this is ideology will work or not. But the issues, I, I see the point, because the leadership wanted to, to use uh, this ideology to unify what this typical Chinese Communist Party propaganda, to unify you know, the thought of, of different sectors of society, the military, you know, the different, different government agencies, you know, because China wanted peace, wanted peace. With this kind of sense, uh, quite a bit useful, uh, useful, uh, very interesting. If you could look at that. So la last time, actually, I wanted, I went to, I went to uh, Yunnan University to have a exchange, and some uh, a young fellow uh, complained because he's a, a India expert, and uh, but he actually published quite a number of articles about the China India and the relations. But he was, uh, I mean. Uh, he, he, he tried to find a job in the Institute of South Asia Studies, but he was rejected. I asked him why, because he, he, he looked at some artic article, very critical about India, so, so the Institute refused, refused him. No, I asked him why, because this is Chinese typical mentality. I think if for people, he will tell that if you want to, to, to study India, if you want to be a great scholar of India, you must love India first. <laughs> if you are critical of India, you have no way. This is a particular Chinese mindset. So people, I feel a, a lot complain. If you, you, you know, in China, if you, you are scholar on United States, you must pro United States. On Japan, you must pro Japan. <laughs> so this is this is very interesting uh, phenomenon. If, so I would say overall, overall, of course, if you look at the media, you know, people will say, "Wow, oh, that's awful." China, India are going to have a war or whatever. But actually, the Chinese population, and the majority of the population, is so Indian friendly. They admire India's civilization, Buddhism, all kinds of lot. Really, I don't see this anti-India sentiment there. Only, only a few journalists. Well, this is, I would say it's a commercial nationalism, you know, because they publish the kind of thing they can attract lots of eyes for what China call. So I think basically, China, India, I don't think it will repeat in the other what uh, uh, the older experience of uh, as a, the rise of other uh, older great power. If you look at that, well, I mentioned the, the ideological fact, factor. If you look at the German or Japan before World War II, then really those country uh, had formed, at that time formed a new type of the ideology, imperialism, expressionism. But uh, in today's China, you don't see any kind of like that. But uh, the, the, the ideology, the leadership is trying to form quite opposite. So that's my thing. Before I ask Kanti, I just want to make a point of clarification. The Institute of South Asian Studies that Yongyan referred to that rejected a young man who didn't love India was not our institute. <laughs> <laughs> that's an institute that's based in Yunnan. Uh, we, we don't require all our scholars to learn in India. It's nice if they do, but uh, just to understand in India. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, so, um, now I invite the Kanti, uh, last but not least, but certainly uh, we look forward to your views, Kanti. Thanks a lot. Um, obviously, I uh, enjoy reading the book a lot. Uh, trying to um, finish a book with my colleague, uh, Professor Wang Jing, on India-China relations. So I, I imagine I'll be trawling this book uh, very assiduously um, and um, using it as grist for the mill for the book that I'm writing with Huang Jing. Um, there's a lot here, obviously, and other speakers have referred to uh, the great scholarship that's in this book. And uh, it's, it's beautifully written. Uh, it's very accessible. Um, and I think it picks up on a, on a kind of an imagination about India-China that's uh, circulari circulating around the, the world rather fast. So I guess I want to just pick up from there. And um, I'll be a bit provocative and say that I think Raj makes a pretty strong, uh, what I'd call circumstantial case for uh, India-China rivalry uh, in this uh, new regional setting, which he calls the Indo-Pacific. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, I don't quite buy it, frankly. Um, the more I thought about the real interests that are driving these two against each other in this huge zone, um, it just doesn't really stack up for me. Um, and I come out of it a bit lukewarm about the possibility of India-China uh, conflict. 
Not the least because, as Tim Huxley pointed out, the power gap is so enormous, it's kind of hard to imagine an India-China conflict of any great seriousness uh, anywhere uh, until India substantially bridges that gap. And even then, it's an open question whether in a very globalized world, uh, when you have nuclear weapons on both sides, uh, that any very substantial uh, outright conflict or even great rivalry is, is terribly plausible. Um, having said that, I, I thought I'd say something about what seems to be driving the imagination. I think there are lots of things that my colleagues have said, so I don't want to, I don't want to repeat those. But it does seem to me that um, at least three things probably uh, is driving the view that there's an emerging maritime uh, conflict. The first is the role of the navies in these two countries themselves, and perhaps other domestic, uh, political, economic interests. Um, navies have their own cultures, and I think when you set up a navy, um, uh, navies attract very smart people, uh, far smarter, it seems to me, than uh, armies. Uh, they're technically more competent. Uh, they're, um, they necessarily, in a sense, look outwards um, because that's the nature of, of, uh, of the maritime. Um, that's the nature of the, the naval. Um, they're not naval gazing, <laughs> if I might make a bad pun. Uh, they necessarily look uh, beyond their own navels. Um, and so I think part of what drives uh, this rivalry is a sense that navies have to look around for people they can beat up uh, beyond their shores. Um, and uh, there are interests here. Uh, the desire to big build ships, to buy ships, uh, inter-service rivalries. I mean, uh, the Indian Navy would like to be bigger and more muscular, as I'm sure the PLA Navy would uh, as well. So I'm a little, I'm being a little playful, but it seems to me that one will have to unpack what's driving naval ambitions in both sides, and I don't think it's pure strategic thinking uh, at all. Uh, the second driver, it seems to me, are external powers, and I don't uh, exculpate Southeast Asians, uh, who would love to uh, bring India particularly uh, into this arena uh, as a kind of counterbalancing uh, navy. Uh, the Southeast Asians and ASEAN have been, always been very clever about bringing other powers into their region, uh, India and South Asia, India particularly in South Asia, historically took a different strategic view, which was to try and keep great powers out and uh, make it into an Indian domain. Uh, this was a fairly foolish idea and it never worked. Uh, but Southeast Asians were far, far more astute. Uh, they invited everybody in. But having invited India in uh, has complicated India's life uh, with China. Um, I think the Americans, uh, of course, have been pitching quite hard to drive an India-China rivalry as part of a larger balance of our game, uh, even as they decline. Uh, although I would say in passing that uh, what's quite discernible over the last couple of years is the deafening silence in New Delhi every time the Americans like Panetta or Hillary Clinton come calling uh, and ask us to be more involved in uh, the Indo-Pacific, as Raj calls it. Um, the silence is so deafening that um, it's now been heard all around the world. Um, and as Raj says in the book, there are quite properly questions about whether the Indians will ever sign up to this, uh, to this game. But still, I think the pressures are on from external powers uh, to get India more involved and to, you know, to construct this rivalry for their own purposes. Um, I think uh, a third driver is, of course, uh, you know, um, in a way, the discourse of realism and of rising powers and, and all of that. But somehow, if you're uh, getting bigger economically, you're bound to become <coughs> bigger militarily. And if you're bigger militarily and economically, then your ambitions grow. Uh, and uh, eventually, if you're big enough, your ambitions are almost global. Um, and that's fairly pernicious, it seems to me. There's nothing automatic. I think Raj portrays uh, the rivalry as being almost ineluctable and automatic because they're rising powers. Uh, frankly, I don't see it. Uh, uh, one can draw on history to say that it's more or less ineluctable, but I think even that might be a pretty stylized history because they're rising powers and have not fought each other or become 
uh, very substantial rival. Um, and I think in a globalized era, it's an open question whether that's really a very serious choice. Nonetheless, uh, I think the academic discourse, the strategic studies discourse, which makes that argument, it's a plausible enough one. And it's spread, and it's in our brains. I mean, I think very few of us can, uh, can think outside it. Um, and so it does help drive uh, the way we think about India-China. So having said that, I think if those are the things that are constructing this imagination, and it's quite powerful, it's not easy for any of us to step outside it, frankly. Um, I think there are three things at least one could say on the other side. Um, the first is that historically, I mean, one big fat elephant in the room is that, uh, or dragon in the room is that, uh, India and China don't have a history of fighting each other. I mean, over a couple of thousand years, there really is no record of India-China fighting. I mean, there may have been skirmishes here and there, and it's interesting that even the 1962 war is referred to the ch by the Chinese as a skirmish. Uh, but uh, these two civilizations and powers have never fought each other. Um, the second is that I think, I guess I buy the view that India and China are not don't have a maritime history. Um, they are, their continental powers very deeply. Um, and I think socially and culturally. I'll just make a crude point about India because I don't know enough about China, but uh, the great heartland of India, uh, with all apologies to my southern Indian friends, uh, is northern India. This is where the bulk of the Indian population lies. And the people of northern India uh, look at water uh, with no great fondness or attachment. I mean, they're not seafaring people. They're not even particularly boating people. I mean, if you float down the Ganges, uh, you're not going to see too many Indians in boats waving at people on the shore. And uh, It's a place of reverence and some communication and mobility. But the people of the Great Plains are not maritime people, and they dominate India. So this idea that India is going to be a maritime power now, I, I'm kind of skeptical on a kind of sociological, cultural uh, ground. Um, and my third point, I'll just stop there, I think my time's running out, is that um, by and large, you know, uh, strategically, especially with China, I think you made the point that China is surrounded by powers. I mean, last time I counted, China had about 27 neighbors, uh, maritime plus land. I don't think any country has that many neighbors, except maybe Russia. And we know the fate of the Russians in terms of their maritime history. So um, it's hard to really think of China. It's so preoccupied with its surroundings, including India, several <laughs> nuclear weapons bars, uh, and all its internal troubles as well, that uh, to see that it, it is very adventurous, and certainly adventurous in the Indian Ocean, where it will be terribly vulnerable to the Americans and the Indians, is a bit of a stretch for me. <coughs> and likewise, I mean, I think, India's got its hands full internally with Pakistan, which, by the way, Pakistan is no minor part. Uh, one of my worries about this book is that Pakistan hardly appears, even in terms of India's maritime reckoning. But Pakistan will be a country of 350 million people in 20 years from now, which will make it about the fifth biggest country in the world. So India will have the second biggest country in population terms, which is China. Uh, because India will have surpassed China in population terms by then. And the fourth or fifth biggest country on its borders. Uh, by the way, Bangladesh will be about 250, 300 million people, which will make it about the sixth biggest country in the world. So, I mean, I think the idea that there's this great, uh, you know, kind of maritime imagination and you know, strategic imagination in either country is vastly exaggerated. Anyway, I'll stop there uh, and see how uh, Raj comes back. I'm sure he'll come back hard on me. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Matthew. So, Ra Raj, do you want to do so now, or do you want to just uh, listen to some more views from the audience uh, before you do some? Okay, give me some, some quick responses, then I'll open the discussion. Floor. Thank you. But I just wanted to refer to three or four points I think that were common to most of this insight to the comments that we've heard uh, in the last uh, few minutes. I think one is the the definitional one, I mean, who's the angel and who's the demon. Uh, sometimes clarity is, a, is not a good thing. Uh, clarity can be, uh, you know, make things too uh, straightforward and actually leave uh, insufficient room for those who want to play the game. 
So I think there is ambiguity there in terms of how this might play out. But I think the metaphor, like all metaphors, uh, can only be applied to some extent. And, and the, the main uh, thing is that uh, it's, it's just not an Indian myth, it's a Hindu myth in the sense. You go to Southeast Asia, you go to anybody who's been to Angkor Wat, uh, will see the Samudra Mantra as a central uh, you know, uh, framework in which much of the philosophy of the Khmer civilization is articulated. So I think the, the fact that these two large countries are turning to the seas, and the consequence of it, and the churning that it might produce, both good and bad, uh, I think that's where uh, the metaphor comes in useful uh, to think about it. And that since the God actually manipulates the whole game in favor of one side, uh, continuously, the God is not neutral. He was uh, a deliberate uh, deception, uh, you know, constantly changed the rules of the game to favor one side, to favor the winners uh, who ultimately uh, come out. So I think. Uh, that I think is a, is, a, is a reference to the great populations where uh, there is a, a possible way in which they could play. Yeah. The second point I think most of them made is that is it sustainable? Uh, are India and China so culturally, historically continental powers? Uh, can they become maritime powers? I think that's a, that's a good question. Uh, that also raises the thing: is the past always a guide to the future? Uh, strategic culture, geography are interesting and enduring, but. Do they prevent anything new from happening in the evolution of a particular society? Uh, my own answer to this is that the nature of the beast in China and India is changing. Uh, that China and India were historically uh, continental powers because their economies were self such uh, Indian philosophy, Indian culture tells you, look, even the realm of imagination of India was within the Himalayan uh, space that was enclosed by the Himalayas. Well, they were strayed by well, other things. It was fundamentally self-sufficient. So was China. Uh, but today, I think the international exposure of just looking at commodities trade in China and India is more than 40% of the economy. It's never been there before. I mean, no other power, even Americans don't have that kind of exposure. What you have today is <coughs> economies of billion plus people. Uh, this is a very different animal. It's nothing to do with the European great powers. We're talking about 10 million, 20 million great power conflict and much of the IR theory is built around it. You have the superpowers then in three numbers, three digits. Now you're talking about people with 1,000 million plus. I mean, this and these economies, when they're integrated with the rest of the world, deeply dependent upon import and exports, there is a, a, a vulnerability to maritime damage, maritime access that never existed before. So I think that is a fundamentally new situation. Now, does this uh, work to overwhelm the historic cultural North Indian laziness in terms of <laughs> or does it actually push I mean, that, that that circumstances change countries and cultures? Uh, that's an open-ended question. I think that can be debated, but I think uh, that is the change that is taking place. Will this make it make the two countries different in terms of how they look at the world? Uh, I think yes, but it's clearly a contestable uh, a contested point. The, the third point is that. Is this, can India and China be Western states or the civilizational states of Western states? Uh, my sense is uh, that while the civilizational thing is there, uh, both the countries, whether it is the Chinese Communist Party or the Indian National Congress, the conception of how they want to organize the society is fundamentally Western. And I don't see any, while there is culture that you have to deal with, uh, mobilize, manipulate, use, uh, I think they're constructing modern states. I mean, I have no problem with that. And, and of course, the others, I mean, those who look at it anthropologically might have other ideas, but I, I think it's work in progress, yes. It is work in progress. And the deep internal vulnerabilities that both China and India have, and I think dealing with those can trip them up. The China can become, like America became a maritime power when it occupied the, all of the landmass of, from east to west, from Atlantic to the Pacific. The Chinese today, I think, largely have settled, except the Indian border, a very stable, land frontiers, and I think they're in a position to move forward. Uh, but whether it will work, whether it's sustainable, uh, anything is possible. But the fact is, even if China builds a reasonable sized navy, that's sending shivers down the spine uh, of the Japanese, of the Americans, of everyone in the region, because they don't have to emerge as a, a full-fledged maritime power. Even if they build what they're building right now, they change the balance of power. And what they build has an effect on the actual situation on the ground. The, 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 the point about, I think, the, the last point, I mean, which is what the team made about asymmetry, I think that's a central element. There is asymmetry of power. Does asymmetry prevent arms races? 
I'm not so sure that uh, states doesn't have to be symmetric to actually pursue armed races. And I think the asymmetry, but he's a key player, whether it will lead India towards alliance with the Americans, or it will accommodate the Chinese. That's also possible. That if you feel Americans are not capable of uh, standing up or sustaining the pivot, and that's the reason why India is silent. It's not sure where the Americans are going. It wants to play its own game. It doesn't want to play the subordinate game to anyone. But it's quite happy buying all force projection equipment from the Americans, the C-17s, the C-130s, the landing platform docking ships. So just because you don't say it, you don't mean you don't want it. And I think the problem in, in, in Indo-Pacific is Americans want Indians to do a lot of balancing. Indians would love to see the Americans do most of the balancing and do cut a deal with the Chinese. So I think this is a classic, uh, uh, shall we say, jockeying, each one playing for their own advantage. And all three have open-ended options. And I, I argue in the book, China is the upper hand because uh, it has more cards to play. How China plays those cards will eventually shape it, and I, I have no doubt. And there, I think, uh, the, 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 the nature of the conflict between India and China, I think, the, in the last 100 years, every time an attempt has been made to bring them together, there's always something else that's put, pulled them apart. Whether it was anti-imperialism or the 30s, whether it was the Cold War, third worldism, uh, or today, they attempt to build a new relationship. But that doesn't mean the relationship is going to be entirely conflictual. What we're going to see is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a complex game in which both of them are going to play for their own interests and try to use the United States to for their own purposes.